I got in uh, in 1941 before uh, Pearl Harbor. They assigned me to a heavy weapons school. We were issued World War I helmets, Springfield rifles, water-cooled 30s that we had to carry in a three-man carry. Patrolling 14 miles of the Gulf Coast beach, somebody had to cover that section of beach and we were picked. So we chipped in $18 a piece and we bought some of these horses. We really couldn't ride a horse. But uh, with proper instructions, we looked professional. I had to carry a Thompson and ride a horse at the same time. Now, these were McClellan's saddles. They had been used by General Pershing when he went down to chase uh, Pancho Villa. We eventually got Jeeps. Jeep with a four-wheel drive could go down into the soggy part, and you could really see out. That's a Springfield with World War I long bayonet, overcoat, and uh, World War I helmet. It was spread out over 14 miles of a beach and on the roof of the Dow Chemical Plant uh, to look for uh, Stuckers or uh, Zeros or whatever we were supposed to look out for. Now, at this stage of my life, I can look back on that particular period and realize that uh, management in the Army at that point was pretty hysterical. We had all kinds of weird instructors. Uh, we had a Russian major there who was continuously drunk, but who really knew his weapons. They told the German POWs they escaped and the Indians caught them. The Indians would get $25 for each uh, scalp that they brought in. And if it was a blonde scalp, they would get a $5 bonus. What some of the guys pulled, they dressed up like Indians with feathers and all kinds of uh, war paint. And when the train pulled in, they attacked the train. And the MPs that were guarding the prisoners told all the prisoners to lie on the floor. They would protect them from the Indians. The uh, couple of months I was in, nobody tried to escape. They had marching songs that were really uh, marching songs. Oh, yeah. Very funny story. It's a very funny story. Uh, after we'd been there a while, uh, a platoon of MPs, big guys with the white helmets and the white leggings and the, uh, were marched in. And I was very pleased because these guys looked great. They looked like real soldiers. And the, uh, I happened to mention to George that, uh, look, these are like real soldiers. George was the... Uh, it was the German POW who uh, spoke English. He said, we could march better than that when we were in school. And at this point, I had learned that they had to uh, uh, work 50 minutes and uh, get a 10-minute break and get an hour for lunch, and uh, we straightened that out. But the thing I found fascinating about the, uh, the Germans is, like me, they try to get away with everything they could. And uh, it's very funny. In any event, the, uh, when, they, when we marched out to our work area, I said to, the, uh, to George, you got to show me. I said, those guys were magnificent, our MPs. He said, okay, Joel, I show you. And he, uh, you know, he hollered all kinds of commands in German, and they put the pickaxes and shovels there, and uh, they lined up, and they went through uh, uh, a close order a routine that was magnificent. It was like ballet dancing. I'd never seen uh, uh, soldiers do that kind, and like some of the, they were like chest to back, and the the way they moved their feet, you know, it looked great. It looked like ballet. However, I'm standing there watching, and all of a sudden, 
the jeep from the, one of the towers with a sergeant and a lieutenant come barreling up. He said, what the hell are you doing, training these guys to go out and fight us again? He said, you can't do that with POWs. I said, I'm sorry, and uh, I put them to work. I had a lot of respect for their training. Uh, I don't think they could uh, get many American boys to, uh, to march like that. They didn't all have complete uniforms. They had uh, blue denim uh, work jackets with a big P painted on in, in white. There's no such thing. They didn't like American army bread. It seems uh, the Germans, they said it wasn't real bread. They used to send us uh, care packages from New York. In one of the care packages, I got a, a loaf of real pumpernickel from the Polish bakery on Essex Street. And George happened to see me uh, eating a hunk of it uh, at our lunch break. And he said, see, that's real bread. Where'd you get it? I said, my family sent it to me from New York. So he spoke to the colonel. Colonel called me in and said, uh, is there any way you can get uh, that kind of uh, flour for the German bakers who know how to bake that kind of bread? I said, when I go home on furlough, I'll ask the baker and he'll tell me. So uh, I asked the baker and I bought a sack, a 60 pound sack of that flour he got from Minnesota, I think, someplace. And I shipped it down to the camp, and the uh, colonel sent a telegram back that it's exactly the kind of flour they need. And uh, I uh, got the name of the mill that used to ship the flour to the baker and the colonel communicated directly with them. They were sending the flour down. And uh, when I came back from furlough, oh, it was very funny. Before I went on furlough, uh, not George, one of the other uh, POWs uh, said to me, he says, wait till you go back to New York. Goering has been bombing your city. He says, you know, you're not gonna have much fun on furlough. So I bought a couple of copies of the Daily Mirror and the news, and uh, at that time they were uh, picture newspapers. And I showed him pictures of Times Square and New York City. And he looked at me and he said, propaganda. And I thought it was funny. But anyway, uh, the colonel told George that I was responsible for the uh, flower. And uh, I think, I'm not sure, I think that for that flower, it was taken out of the $6 a month that they got of uh, PX tickets. I think they had to pay for it themselves. I'm not sure. But as part of the deal, I, uh, I got a loaf of bread every couple of days. I didn't have to eat the army bread, you know, which is good, good white bread. But I grew up on that kind of uh, pumpernickel, you know. Uh, anyway, what eventually happened is uh, I got into trouble. Uh, what happened is because I always picked the work area that was furthest out, and I used to march the guys out double time. Every hard case in the whole goddamn POW group was shoved into my squad. I didn't know this at the time. The idea was that uh, a lot of the other guards used to pick areas closer to camp so they could walk out, you know, give the guys a 10 minute break, and they themselves didn't have to be that alert. And what kind of work did the, the guys do? They were building, digging holes in the road that they would put culverts in, big six foot uh, corrugated iron, you know, uh, culverts, galvanized, because it seemed that there are flash floods in that part of Oklahoma that wash out the roads, but if there are culverts, the water runs under the road. 
And they were trying to make a real camp out of this, you know, because uh, at that point we didn't know how long the war would last, and they were figuring on more prisoners. I was told they were going to eventually build barracks, you know, things like that. Meanwhile, everybody was intense. We were out there working, and then they were on a 10-minute break, and I hadn't started smoking yet. And uh, they were all smoking. And all of a sudden, there was one guy missing. So I stand up, I'm looking around, and I hear something behind me. It seems with a pickaxe, he'd crawl through the culvert and come up behind me. And he started raising the goddamn thing, and I dropped to one knee, and I butt-stroked him with the um, M1. And of course, broke his jaw, and his tongue was hanging out. And I fired a shot to alert the guys on the tower. We had a machine, a uh, water-cooled 30 on the tower. And uh, again, the sergeant and the lieutenant came barreling down. Meanwhile, I had taken the tongue out of the guy so he wouldn't choke on it, see? And uh, in English, I said, uh, I got eight rounds here. If anybody wants to start anything, you know, uh, you may get me, but eight of you are going to be uh, full of, you know, are going to have bullet holes in you. There were a lot of disturbed uh, Nazis in that gang. Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, what happened is, uh, the uh, sergeant that came out, I had to turn in my weapon and my ammunition and go back to the uh, headquarters, and I was on uh, house arrest until my court-martial. Had the guys in the guard tower seen what happened? Yes. They were my witnesses. And uh, they had a court-martial, and I was fined a dollar and 12 cents. And I was told the reason was if we lost the war, I couldn't be uh, uh, charged with war crimes. And I said, what the hell is it 12 cents for? And they said, well, that's to pay for the round that you fired off. Bullets cost 12 cents a piece. And what was the dollar for? A, a symbolic fund, you know. And my punishment was marching him to the dentist twice a day and, uh, you know, guarding him while he was there. Once I was court-martialed, I was clean, so they issued me the M1 again. Anyway, I did that job for a while until I got the uh, colonel there pissed off. But the colonel had some buddies in an artillery training camp that had been to West Point with him or something. In uh, North Africa, the Germans had uh, commando units that used to try to uh, uh, sneak in and uh, take over our uh, uh, artillery, to go through our lines. So we figured it was a good way to get rid of me, and since I was detached anyway, I would show them how to guard their uh, cannon. So they actually got rid of me. So I show up, there. I had to turn in my weapon, of course, and the ammunition. And I had to wait for a truck to take me to Fort Sill. See, what happened was these artillery men uh, were supposed to be training on 155s, which was, I think it's five, seven miles or something. I don't know too much about artillery. But they had these old World War I cannon. Uh, that they were getting basic training with, you know, just to learn how to uh, handle the cannon. Because the 155 was a heavy gun. I think they also learned on the 105. But the gang that I was working with were brand new. And they were very sloppy. Since the war was on, there was no more two months of uh, basic training. They got uh, four weeks or six weeks, then they were assigned to a specialty. And these were all draftees, I would imagine. Yeah, young guys. I saw that uh, they used to like to congregate and smoke once the officer of the day had uh, checked the gun. And, you know, I used to skirt around where they were, uh, they had the gun set up. And I studied them and studied them. Then when I went into town on a pass, you could buy in those days, you could buy a jar of graphite powder, it was called. And I decided I'd try to do a steal one of the breech blocks. 
It wasn't a big breach because it was only about this big. But it wasn't supposed to make noise. So what I would do is I'd march up to these guys and uh, ask them, you know, what's the seventh order? While I was there, I'd lean on the, uh, on the cannon and uh, I'd dribble some of the uh, graphite onto the top. They'd already cleaned the gun, you know, so they were done with that and the officer of the day had been through. And then what happened was that uh, they used to congregate at one end, and it was warm in Oklahoma, and they had these new field jackets, you know, uh, with pockets and all. And uh, so they took off all their webbing and the field jackets and put them down. And I uh, slid the uh, breech block out because what had happened after they'd gone down to the other end, you know, where they could sit on something, uh, the, um, I think it's called the cations, where they kept the ammunition boxes, then they could sit on those. And the cannon was like, you know, maybe twice as far as across this room. And then I'd crawl, belly crawl up to the cannon. I'd slide out the uh, breech block, it was very quiet. And I take the, uh, I took the breech block out, and I'd sneak back. And when the charge of quarters let me into the uh, office, I said, uh, tell the colonel this is from me. I'd already wiped it clean, you know. And uh, I think I had some toilet paper that I folded up and I put it on. Uh -huh. dirty his desk. He was very pissed off, incidentally. So what the hell were they doing? But they were sitting on the bo ammunition boxes and smoking and gossiping. Uh, the colonel really chewed their ass. But that was just one, uh, one crew. They had like, I don't know, 20 crews that uh, they were all along the camp. They had to train a lot of guys at once because they were manufacturing a lot of cannons. And then another night, what I did is I uh, was down at the uh, rec hall, and I found a piece of the chalk that they use for uh, the uh, cues, you know, the chalking the end of the billiard clues. It was laying on the floor, I took that. And another night, I went to where they had laid their field jackets, and I made X's on them. And, uh, when Reveille came, you know, and uh, these guys showed up at Reveille you know, in the field jackets, uh, I told the colonel that uh, these three guys uh, tell them to turn around. So the colonel called them over and uh, said, about face, and they did. I said, see those X's? I chalked these X's on them while they were supposed to be on guard duty. And he said, I want to see you men, you know, after uh, uh, after child, and he said, Kovic, he says, what you're doing is you're making all my men nervous. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, I said, isn't that, which, isn't that supposed to be alert? And uh, he says, you'll never get anywhere in the Army. Uh, it seems that the West Pointers are very big on rank. And at that time, I was an acting uh, corporal. You had to have some rank, or you know. Uh, and I was still detached, which I think is funny. By then it was 1943, early in 1943. And uh, MacArthur wanted noncoms. They'd lost a lot of noncoms in the Pacific, especially at Buna in New Guinea, yeah. And uh, a bunch of us from all over the country wound up at some camp in California. I don't know, it may have been Pendleton, I don't remember the name of it. 
and uh, we were segregated. And for weeks, I was climbing up and down these damn cargo nets. They were very big on cargo nets. This was preparatory to doing beach landing. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to take a break. Mm -hmm.